Well, I think we'll get started. Uh, perhaps there'll be a few more people trickling in. Um, I'm Michael Green, um, a general internist uh, at the medical school at Yale. Uh, and let me introduce my two colleagues uh, to my immediate left, Aloysius Humbert, but he almost always goes by Butch, yeah. um, and uh, Alan Hull. They're both uh, deans of curriculum, uh, Butch at uh, Indiana University and Alan at the uh, Cleveland Clinic Learner School of Medicine. Um, and I have to say that I, I had a fair amount of selfish motivations for agreeing to facilitate this symposium and I'm hoping to learn uh, a lot more information than I impart. Uh, I have been involved in, in competency-based medical education for a long time, but uh, nearly exclusively at the GME level. I've been fortunate to work on the task force uh, in association with the ABIM and ACGME in uh, developing and revising the internal medicine uh, reporting milestones. Um, you can blame me for the PBLI milestones if you don't like those. Um, but I, I recently had a, had a big change in my career. I'm still at Yale, but now I'm at the medical school and director for a student assessment, and we're in the middle, in the throes of a big curriculum rebuild, and I'm trying to consider uh, this approaches in competency-based medical education at the undergraduate level and trying to persuade uh, a very uh, old a traditional institution that's resistant to change to consider some of these concepts. Uh, so when they, they asked me to do this, I said, I'm not going to do it unless you get me a guy from Indiana and a guy from Lerner, because I knew that these two schools were kind of at the vanguard. Um, and I said that in jest, because who am I to make a request like that? But they got them. And so I, I guess I have a little more juice than I than I thought. So um, the objectives for today will be that you would be able to understand the CME movement. Uh, I put movement in quotes because I find when, when people start to criticize something, they call it a movement. Uh, it's history, it's promises and controversies that you would appreciate uh, innovative strategies, uh, as you'll hear about in these two schools, to implement CBME recognize the challenges and potential solutions, and consider ways to manage a more seamless transition, uh, developmental transition from UME to GME. So I'm gonna begin with the overview, and then you'll hear from uh, Alan and Butch, and we're all three of us very committed to uh, leave a healthy amount of time for questions, because I find that I learn the most uh, in the, that part of these kind of seminars, and I'm often frustrated that there's five minutes left and there's 12 hands in the air. So uh, we won't let that happen. So what is, what is competency-based medical education? Um, and let me compare it to the traditional model, which we began with the curriculum um, and wrote objectives that often were specific to a particular course and might have reflected the particular expertise or interest or inclinations of those writing the objectives, um, and then use that as a starting point to develop the curriculum and the assessment. Uh, Competency-based model kind of turns that around and asks us to begin with the health needs uh, of the health system and articulate competencies that are not course-specific or discipline-specific. Um, and use that as the starting point to develop the curriculum uh, and the assessment system. And there are many competency frameworks. I mean, we talked about the ACGME six competencies that you're all familiar with, but there's CanMeds in Canada and uh, the General Medical Education Council in the United Kingdom and uh, uh, various other frameworks. So, um, the ACGME, I'm going to begin 
uh, by talking about GME and transition quickly to UME. The, the outcomes project uh, for the ACGME began in 1998, and this is what Tom Naska had to say about it in 2010. He said very humbly, a charitable assessment would be that we have not gotten very far and are right about where we started six years ago. So the, 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 the uh, aspiration to implement true CBME in GME was stalled uh, for several reasons that, uh, some of which I think will be obvious to you. There were many distractions. Uh, hospitals were under financial pressure. The um, physicians at teaching hospital audits uh, were tormenting hospitals. Many hospitals were struggling to comply with duty hours. Uh, there was a lament that, that this was an unfunded mandate um, and, and programs claimed that they didn't have the faculty expertise, the time, the resources. The competencies themselves were articulated in uh, a glib language and, and it wouldn't be uncommon to hear faculty screaming, I don't know what practice-based learning is, I don't know what systems-based practice is. And there was a fair amount of, of, of resistance uh, coming out of the medical education community. One is a fear of the disruption of the community feel of the residency program itself because one of the implications of CBME is that residents were progressing based on attainment of competencies and not a prescribed dwell time. So maybe residents could end up graduating early um, and there was fear that you would sort of skim off the, the best residents who were acting as role models for the, the rest of the program. Uh, there was a, a lot of what, what I'm calling psychometric skepticism. Uh, uh, an accusation that the science was well behind the prescriptions and did we really have uh, instruments that were valid and reliable and feasible enough to evaluate these competencies. Although the underlying presumption from that comment is that what we were doing already had all of that psychometric <laughs> support. Um, and I think probably the most legitimate criticism, I think, was this uh, ever-present tension between quantifiable measures and authentic representation of doctoring. Um, you know, there was a fear that there would be an, uh, an inevitable, unresistible urge to slice and dice the competencies up to smaller and smaller units that could be measured uh, in a laboratory setting outside of the clinical context and achieve the, the perfect Kronbach Alpha. And by doing that, we would really lose the authenticity uh, of, of what it is to really take care of a patient, which I'm sure you would agree is, is more than the sum of its parts. So I like to think, uh, given those challenges, I've come to think of of the developmental milestones and, and EPAs, which we won't stand, spend very time on, as kind of rescuing the competencies, rescuing the CBME movement. Um, I see the milestones as adding explication and a developmental perspective, and I see the EPAs as adding integration and an authentic clinical context. So let's talk first about the milestones. Um, these are often articulated as iconic developmental narratives, and there's an emerging literature on uh, how raters or faculty supervisors respond to these kind of scales uh, in comparison to your typical one through nine or satisfactory, medium, superior, or never, sometimes frequency ordinal, ordinal scales. Uh, they benefit from having a much closer construct alignment. Um, you're actually rating the learner on something that's much closer to the construct, not one through nine. Um, and they're in a way neutral. Uh, you know, if you're at that developmental stage, then that's where you're at, and this is where we want you to be at in the future, which is, more palatable to both learners and 
more importantly, overcomes a lot of the cognitive biases of raters in terms of giving somebody a four as opposed to just saying this, this iconic narrative best matches with your performance. Um, and in the limited experience we've accumulated so far, they've uh, shown to be better, uh, more reliable, um, and have better discrimination among uh, learners, especially at identifying struggling learners than these numeric scales. And they're um, more friendly in terms of facilitating feedback and action plans. So, so what did we do, just very briefly, um, we, we articulated milestones for internal medicine that described the developmental progression of observable behaviors. We started with what we called the threshold milestone, where we wanted them to be, uh, to be able to graduate. And importantly, our, our litmus test was that they, would safe, they, they could safely enter independent practice, but with full recognition that they were not fully cooked and that there were, there's a very important part of professionalization that can only happen uh, when you bear the full weight uh, uh, of patient responsibility. Um, and we came up with, with a developmental progression that proceeded on the basis of either levels of independence, complexity, or illness severity. Um, and this was, um, this is something, uh, representative of what's going to happen in the new accreditation system when uh, the programs are going to be reporting uh, residents' progress along these milestones to the ACGME once or twice a year. Um, and you can see in the gray is, is, is two standard deviations below the mean, and this one program in black is, is falling behind in practice-based learning and improvement. Um, and programs are going to be reporting these once or, once or twice a year. Um, in the first couple years, they're not going to really count uh, in terms of having true currency in accreditation decisions, but they eventually will uh, once the ACGME collects some data. There's some irony in this slide that I, I um, in that one of the bedrock premises of, of competency-based medical education is that in assessment, you're doing criterion assessment. You know, you're saying that there's an absolute threshold that you want learners to reach, whereas two standard deviations below the mean is, is uh, a normative assessment. So I, I think the ACGME has to re rethink that as a category. So this is just an example of one of the PBLI milestones that is part of the reporting milestones that, that were made public uh, in January of this year. Uh, it identifies residents uh, at a level of a critical deficiency, progresses up to unsupervised practice, and also has a uh, aspirational category for uh, a goal for the highly performing residents. Um, uh, I talked a little bit about the G GME experience. We piloted these narratives with several residency programs, asked them to convene their clinical competency committees, look at these reporting milestones and see whether they could really recognize each individual resident within the developmental progression and whether there was sufficient data coming in from the frontline evaluations to help them do that. Um, I would just uh, recognize programs at Arkansas, Southern Illinois, and Bay State as probably having the best experience with developmental milestones. Uh, we've been working with them at Yale uh, in our acute care for the elderly unit, and the, the big national experience will start in July with the next accreditation system. So let's uh, move to, to the UME before I turn it over to my colleagues. Um, Bob Englander was supposed to be part of this panel but, but couldn't make it, uh, but I had a chance to have a, a phone call with him. He's at the AAMC and he's heading up the CBME efforts there. Uh, they're very supportive of CBME and, and are doing a lot to 
promote it and, and help medical schools. Uh, he told me about the Pediatric Milestones Project, which is, I think, a pilot project happening at about four or five schools where they're taking uh, first-year students who, who, as much as they can, have uh, identified themselves as wanting to be pediatricians, um, and they're, I think, guaranteeing them a, a slot at the pediatric residency program at the same institution, and are going to try to follow them in a seamless way through a developmental milestone progression uh, from UME to GME. Uh, he feels that uh, the average medical school is five to seven years behind uh, graduate medical education in, in developing and implementing uh, CBME. But I can tell you that these two schools are ahead. They're, they're really at the vanguard. Um, and when I was in my new position at Yale, uh, researching what was going on at other medical schools, I was completely impressed with uh, uh, competency-based medical education at, at Lerner and uh, Indiana. So I'm going to uh, let them share your experience, their experience with you. Uh, and I think there are some challenges that may be somewhat particular to UME that we didn't face in uh, GME. Certainly there are less developed learners. Uh, any milestones that you would articulate are not specialty specific. Um, and what's the threshold milestone for GME? Where do you want them to be to start residency programs? Also, the class size is much bigger at most medical schools. Learner is an exception, perhaps. Um, and and there's, there's, I think, on average, less of sort of a longitudinal, individual, intimate relationship with particular faculty as sometimes can happen in residency programs, and maybe less continuity. So I'm going to turn it over to Alan and let him uh, tell you about his experience at the Learner School. Uh, thanks, Michael. Thank you for uh, coming on this beautiful afternoon. Um, the Cleveland Clinic Learner College of Medicine is actually a track within Case Western. Uh, uh, Cleveland Clinic is not a degree-granting institution. We developed an affiliation with uh, Case Western, admitted our first class of 32 students a year, relatively small, very small, um, in 2004. Uh, we had a very specific, unique, uh, or very specific at least, a mission. We want to train uh, physician investigators. We want people coming out of the medical school program to be excellent clinicians, to be inquisitive, uh, to have great uh, clinical skills, but also have the fundamental knowledge and, and interest in research so that eventually uh, they'll end up doing uh, both clinical care as well as research. Um, and we're going to be following our graduates to see how successful uh, we are. We did have the advantage of uh, not, uh, uh, not having an existing class, not having an existing program. So the model that Michael uh, uh, indicated that uh, was very helpful for competency-based education in uh, GME worked very well for us as well. We got faculty together. There were eight specific um, uh, characteristics of the graduates that we wanted to, to have, uh, have our students uh, be able to, to to master by the time they got through. We divided that uh, into um, nine competencies. Now the nine competencies that we have, seven of them match directly into the ACGME competencies and we uh, are very proud of that. It, it's, uh, it should help with the, the transition of our students to into residency programs. We also added uh, research and uh, personal uh, uh, development. Uh, as uh, the nine competencies to make up nine. Uh, I think Michael's uh, talked uh, and explained very well the difference between uh, developing a competency-based curriculum and a uh, one that's built on the more traditional model of learning objectives. We had to learn this uh, ourselves and, and work with our faculty to, 
to uh, get away from the idea of starting with learning objectives, but to think uh, broadly about what, what it is that we want our graduates to look like, what kind of characteristics we want these people to have, and then uh, what kind of uh, learning activities and assessment system we need to develop in order to promote those. Uh, and so we uh, have these nine competencies. There's uh, specific standards, which I guess could be uh, uh, interpreted as milestones. There's probably uh, four to five uh, standards uh, that students have to achieve in each one of the nine competencies at the end of year one, at the end of year two, and the beginning of year five. We're a five-year program, by the way, to allow time for research. Uh, one of the examples that uh, I'll show you here is our research competency, which is, uh, I hope you can read it up there. Uh, uh, it's a definition uh, that's uh, very broad, but, but gets across to uh, faculty and students uh, what it is that we want them to be able to accomplish. The, one of the uh, year one standards, and again, there's four or five of them, but one of the year one standards is to demonstrate ability to critically review basic science research papers. Uh, this is something that they do during the summer during a clinical journal club, but also is re, uh, repeated throughout the, uh, the school year. We set up specific criteria for uh, standards uh, as faculty were thinking these through, um, and I've mentioned uh, what, uh, what uh, those uh, standards are, and, and this is something that's very specific, it's measurable, and uh, we can find out what, where students are in this. The, the whole process of competency-based assessment really drove the development of our curriculum. Um, the competency-based assessment, as, as Michael uh, pointed out, is, is uh, really focused on, on outcomes. And it assesses a broad range of things, not just knowledge, but professionalism and, and other things that are uh, in, in the competency-based uh, system. Uh, it's authentic. It's uh, something that really looks at characteristics of, of our graduate. Uh, it's something that uh, every student is expected to achieve these standards. So they can't graduate unless they, uh, or they can't even progress unless they have uh, met them. It's not norm referenced. It's a very specific uh, demonstration of being able to do skills. Uh, the, the thought is, uh, I think, and eventually we're going to be able to take this on as a profession, that the trajectory may be different for different students. What we're doing now is it's a time-based system, it's five years to get through our program, but students that do get master this stuff a little bit earlier are, um, are challenged with some extra work that they develop uh, on their own. And uh, uh, lastly, the competency-based assessment system that we developed we wanted it to be uh, a teaching system. We wanted them to learn from their assessments, not just to, to get a score on a test or, or get a pass or something like that. We wanted them to have a good understanding of what they did well and what they need to work on. And so it had to be uh, 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 formative in nature. We'll talk about that in a second. We also place uh, uh, direct responsibility on the students to be the responsible for their own learning and also for their colleagues' learning, and they're accountable for that. Uh, the initial challenge was to get our faculty ready for this and, and then train the students for it. And it's, it's a, a different system than um, what uh, many of us came up through in, in our own medical education uh, program. It's a focus on uh, changing from the easily measured, the, the test scores, into things that are much more difficult to measure, these constructs of, of uh, professionalism and, and even uh, being ability to apply knowledge. Uh, focus on not identifying a failing student, you know, kind of weeding people out, but it's trying to get uh, people, all the students, up to a, a, at least a minimal uh, level uh, in, in your program. It's uh, not about making grades, it's about uh, being able to reach a, a specific standard. And we're changed from something that was teacher-driven, something that was uh, where we uh, would walk into the classroom and, and uh, tell students, uh, give them a lecture on something, that's something much more uh, learner responsibility and learner-centered so that, that uh, students would prepare for uh, classes, come in, and, and the faculty would challenge them with questions and, and uh, application of that knowledge. And it takes time to build this kind of culture. It's, it's very different, and uh, uh, to be perfectly honest, we're still working on that. Uh, 
the, the reason that the assessment system that we came up with drives the education uh, program is that there has to be a good alignment. You can't assess somebody uh, on uh, a competency or standard that they haven't had the opportunity to learn and to demonstrate. Uh, and actually, that's a very useful part of competency-based uh, uh, based education because it keeps the focus on the, on the, the behaviors and the, and the skills that you're really looking for. Um, and you have to use uh, methods that uh, allow students to demonstrate and, and document their understanding and mastery of these types of things. So as I said, we, we, we use formative assessment in our program. We want it to... To, uh, we want our assessment system to help students understand where their strengths and weaknesses are and uh, help them learn uh, how to identify what it is that they need to learn. There has to be summative assessment. At some point, uh, we have the responsibility to pass them from year to year, and we have the responsibility to say they've met all our standards at the end of the five-year curriculum, and uh, we do do that at very specific parts of our, our curriculum. The formative assessment, though, is uh, well, it shows up pretty well. Uh, the formative uh, assessment, this is an example of the kind of assessment that our, all our faculty do. And this has taken uh, a, a great deal of training and, and, uh, and uh, uh, convincing of the, the faculty to be able to provide these kind of comments. Whenever we fill out evaluation forms for our students, um, we uh, organize the feedback in terms of the competencies that we're uh, taking a look at, and we provide comments about very specific targeted areas for improvement, or what our students call taffies, and areas of strength. They get multiple assessments. Uh, they probably get uh, a couple of hundred forms like this completed each year of the curriculum. And from that, they're able to get an idea, and their physician advisor is able to get an idea of uh, what it is that they're um, uh, what, they, what their strengths are, have they met the minimum standards. So this evidence database that, we, that the students have, uh, again, it consists of all the data that are being collected throughout the, the curriculum. The only two people that can see that information are the student and his or her physician advisor. Physician advisor is, gets release time to do this. They're with the student for five years, uh, and they're the, the student's advocate. They don't evaluate the student, but they help the students go through this data and understand it. Uh, there's a lot of discussions. There's a lot more meetings at the very beginning of the, the first year, and they get more uh, spaced out as students get more comfortable, but uh, the physician advisors look at all the data that's coming in on a weekly basis for each student that they're responsible for. Uh, students do formative portfolios uh, uh, throughout the first year and the second year, and actually in, in each year, uh, which involve a discussion and learning plan development on the part of the student as they work with their physician advisor. This is a, uh, so this is a pair of people that are working on uh, understanding what the, the student needs to work on uh, until the next meeting. Uh, from that comes the learning plan that is monitored by the physician advisor. At the end of year one, at the end of year two, and, the, and at the very beginning of year five, there's a summative portfolio where students uh, compile all the evidence uh, from their, uh, or reflect on the, on the evidence that's in their evidence uh, database, and write nine two-page essays. Uh, the nine essays are each one of the competencies, and in those essays, uh, they have to uh, explain why they have met the standard. Uh, so there, there's maybe four standards in professionalism. They have to uh, write an essay uh, explaining how they've met the, the, uh, each individual standard, and what it's like a research paper in that the, um, the uh, evidence that they cite is, is like a uh, reference in the... Uh, in this essay. Uh, the promotions committee looks at these and determines whether they think the student has met the, the standards. And uh, the physician advisor reviews the summative uh, portfolio, but only in, the, in saying that it's authentic, it's the student's work, and that the student uh, hasn't uh, cherry-picked the things. The student is being very honest in terms of what their strengths and weaknesses are. Uh, the portfolio uh, timetable that we have, uh, again, it's uh, three times in the first year. It takes about six months for students to make the transition from university lecture uh, individual work 
type uh, environment into this team uh, uh, approach to uh, getting feedback like this. Uh, there's fewer uh, formative assessments as it goes on. Uh, at the in year five, uh, they have this formative assessment being at the beginning of the year, and then there's a kind of a cleanup at the end of the year of just before graduation to make sure that they've uh, met all the requirements. This uh, graph shows the uh, the uh, um, decisions that have been made by the MSPRC. This is our uh, Student uh, Promotions Review Committee that makes the summative decisions. And the green uh, is a, a, a represents a, a pass for uh, all, all uh, for the students, and it's remained fairly. Uh, uh, stable during our, our experience. We're about 86 percent of, uh, of the students getting a, a full pass uh, so they can go on to the next year. The yellow represents uh, a pass with concerns. Uh, you know, they, the student did a good job, but there's a couple of things that the promotions committee is concerned about. That goes back to the student and their physician advisor and they, uh, uh, the student and the advisor come up with a plan for how the student is going to address that, but it doesn't have to go back to the uh, the promotions committee. The red are uh, the students that uh, are uh, required to do remediation. And there, that is a specific plan, a specific weakness that has been identified by the promotions committee. They want a plan from the student and then they, the promotions committee monitors that until it's done. And just uh, and, uh, as a, uh, a wrap-up for this process, just to show you the kinds of problems that students have um, this is the results over those years uh, from the, um, uh, the students that were placed in remediation at the end of year one. And I've highlighted the, the professionalism competency because, you know, many people would think that it would be the, the, the knowledge uh, competency, but it's really what is tripping students up more often than not are professionalism things such as attendance, such as uh, uh, Conscientiousness and, and uh, uh, um, you know, be, being helpful and, and uh, not being uh, 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 overly aggressive in, in uh, PBL classes and, and things like that. Uh, similar findings for the uh, summary findings for the year two. Uh, there's certainly other uh, competencies that are listed there, but professionalism uh, shows up quite uh, frequently. And then in years three through five, uh, uh, during that time, students uh, uh, can end up uh, referred to the promotions committee because of uh, some problems uh, in the clerkship rotations. Are these yeah. Uh, that's a great question uh, as to whether the, uh, they're, they're repeat offenders or they're new people. I think uh, we have looked at that. I believe that most of them are, are unique. There's something new that shows up. They're not repeat offenders. There are some, unfortunately, very few that, that are, have trouble throughout the, the, the curriculum. But most of them, um, the remediation is done, and then they don't uh, um, end up in that category again. Good question, question though. Uh, so that's the, the, the program at uh, the Cleveland Clinic Learner College of Medicine. One thing, if I could uh, just uh, ask you to put your thinking uh, caps on here in terms of the discussion session. One of the, the problems I think we have to, to think about is if we do these, uh, 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 this competency-based assessment plan, especially in medical schools, we have to find a way of presenting that to the residency programs that's something that the residency programs can understand. We're, we're being driven to do the uh, competency-based education, but the way residents select most of their applicants is based on numbers. And that's not what our students, that's not what our students have. If you're really a competency-based uh, education, we're, we're very confident we can certify that our students meet the standards that we've set but there's no way of rank ordering them. And that's become an issue. We have to really uh, work with our students to get them the interviews in, at uh, competitive residencies. So I'll just put that as a, a little plug.
All right. So we're going to go from the spectrum of small medical schools to large medical schools with Indiana. We have, as opposed to 32 students in a class, we currently have about 324 students per class. So we're kind of on the opposite end of the spectrum. So Comsey Based Medical Education at IU, however, started um, as part of a curricular reform back in 1996 and uh, was implemented back in 1999. At the time, the school adopted their competency framework, which was based uh, at least in part on some of the work that was done at the Alpert Medical School at Brown University. So here is our list of our nine IUSM core competencies. Uh, most of the titles are pretty descriptive of the competency content um, that's contained in them. The using science to guide diagnosis, management, therapeutics, and prevention actually encompasses kind of the acquisition of medical knowledge, which really was the predominant um, uh, predominant in our curriculum prior to this revision. So the edu educational outcomes for IUSM are organized by levels of achievement for each of the competencies. So students um, are required to meet the achievement at level two um, for all nine of the competencies. And they're actually able to do that throughout their required courses and clerkships uh, through a series of educational activities and assessments um, that if they perform adequately on all of those, they will be certified at level two prior to graduation. Then during the fourth year, students are required to achieve a level three in three of the nine competencies, which is kind of an advanced uh, level. And this really kind of allows them to individualize their, their curriculum um, in a, and achieve an advanced level in an area of interest. Here's just a sample of the level two competency criteria. Um, this one is for the problem solving competency. And students, like I said, are assessed on a variety of different uh, clerkships and courses in their problem solving abilities. There's also something we call a competency director. And that's an individual faculty member who is charged with kind of developing and implementing uh, the curriculum for one of the nine competencies. So this frequently involves working with course and clerkship directors to develop and implement uh, different competency-based materials as well as assessments. And then at the end of the second year, the competency directors review each student's progress and then certify that they've reached their level one prior to the students starting their third year. And then again, certify they've reached level two prior to graduation. And the decision really is based on assessments that are performed throughout the curriculum. Their performance on the competency curriculum is actually captured in a competency transcript, which accompanies their uh, residency applications and dean's letters and indicates where they're at in the spectrum of the competency uh, curriculum. So when our, our new curriculum was implemented, it really was initially implemented by identifying c content and assessments that were already being done but just needed to be labeled as being competency-based. You know, we, we, were, we were evaluating how our students were doing in history and physical, but it wasn't called basic clinical skills. Um, next, the course and clerkship directors were asked to work with the competency directors to develop new competency-related content and assessments for the courses based on area of interest and then also areas of logical fit um, related to different elements of their, of their competency area. And for the clerkship years, in addition to uh, the competency-based evaluations for clinical activities, they also each selected at least one of the competencies to formally assess during their clerkship. So initially, the competency grades were submitted to a completely different separate system from the traditional letter grades. And as we kind of moved along, this seemed kind of out of line with the idea that, um, you know, that our curriculum was based on these nine competencies. So what we did a few years ago was develop and adopted what we call the combined grade sheet, which contains both sort of your traditional grade for us, which is honors high pass pass, um, with the competency assessments as well. So as you can see here, there's a, actually a box for each of the clerk, for the clerkships for each of the competencies. There's a separate box where the the competency, or I'm sorry, the clerkship director um, is able to comment on a student's performance in that area. Um, so the choices for these assessment are satisfactory, satisfactory with concerns, or isolated deficiency. Um, if the satisfactory with concerns is chosen then those comments that are in that comment to competency director box are actually automatically forwarded to that competency director. And then they can review them. What that does, that allows them to identify trends in individual students who might be having difficulty over, over different courses and clerkships that may not have risen to the level of failing a course or a clerkship yet, um, but maybe there's a trend there where they could intervene earlier to try and improve the students' outcomes. 
During the clerkship years, it became apparent that occasionally a student would really struggle in one particular competency-related area, but they'd do pretty well otherwise in everything else and, you know, uh, and would meet all the requirements to pass the clerkship with the exception of one area. So the isolated deficiency uh, grade was essentially created for these circumstances because failing a clerkship and having to repeat an eight-week experience um, seemed a little bit harsh if it was a, an isolated area, um, but yet just offering the student that formative feedback seemed to not be a strong enough uh, action. Um, so for example, if a student's repeatedly late for clinical duties, but then responds to the feedback um, at the, at the uh, real time that they need to, to improve, and then they improve and they pass everything else for the clerkship, they might receive an ID9, um, which would be an, an isolated deficiency in professionalism. We label it with the number of the competency after that. There's a remediation plan that's developed between the competency director and the clerkship director, reviewed by our student promotions committee, and once the student completes that remediation, that grade on the, on the transcript is actually changed, on the real transcript is actually changed to an ID9 slash P. So it's, it does remain a part of their permanent record. At this point, we're going to kind of look at some of the different competency-based activity and assessments that we utilize at IUSM. Um, so to receive your level two and basic clinical skills, students are required to be directly observed, satisfactorily performing a, a, a number of different skills, including things like taking a history, starting an IV, suturing a wound, amongst a, a number of other things. And these observations are documented using a mobile web system um, where the student is able, actually able to in, enter the information about the encounter and then this, uh, the facilitator, the preceptor, who's actually direct, doing the direct observation, is actually, to, actually able to verify that um, using a PIN number um, uh, directly on the student's mobile application, on the mobile device. And it really has been helpful. It's very easy to perform at the bedside. Um, with Wi-Fi being prominent in all of our hospitals now, students haven't had, issues with, haven't had many issues with web connectivity. Um, and it really has been a very effective way to monitor a large number of students' progress in these areas. Um, an, an enhancement they're actually working on right now is to include sort of dynamic checklists into, these, into this application so that when you, let's say you're going to start an IV, the checklist of the different uh, steps that you need to take will be there so that the f observer can actually then click off on things that are done or not done um, so that then when the student, we get additional information about how the student's doing, more detailed feedback, and then also Overall, as a class, we can see, well, if everyone is missing these particular steps of this particular skill, then maybe we need to relook at our curriculum in that area. And so it really, I think, has a, a, a lot of potential to help, uh, help inform what we're doing. In addition to our course in EBM and biostatistics in the second year, a longitudinal EBM curriculum has been developed during the third year as part of the lifelong learning competency. This includes sessions with librarians to, librarians to optimize search strategies, additional training and practice and evaluating validity of different articles. Um, and at the conclusion of this curriculum, there's actually a separate test on, based on that EBM content. And there's actually even a, a high stakes OSCE case that's been added to our, our fourth year uh, OSCE, uh, or end of third year OSCE, whichever we'd like to call it, and, um, and that they're also required to pass in order to graduate. As part of the self-awareness competency, students take part in peer and self-assessment. During the first, second, and third years of medical school, they complete surveys um, on a number of their classmates. Uh, they're asked to respond to Likert scale items and provide comments related to students' engagement in activities, their leadership skills, their openness and responsiveness to others, as well as a number of other different observable behaviors. Um, and the student also then completes that same survey on looking at themselves. And then they're provided with the data from their peers, obviously anonymously, um, and they're able to compare what their peers thought of them with what they thought of themselves. And it's very interesting sometimes to see some of the discrepancies between those two things. Um, and what they do then is they actually meet with a faculty member um, and they go over those. The faculty member gets a chance to review the same, the same data points um, and then have a discussion about how the student could utilize that information to really improve themselves over, the, over, over time. For our problem solving competency, one of the things the students do is take a script concordance test, which was used to evaluate their data interpretation skills. They actually, it's, we use it as a progress test, so they take the exam twice, once at the start of their second year, once at the start of their fourth year, and students are then provided with their scores. Um, so in the first year, or second year, obviously they get one score, but in the fourth year, then they get to see not only their scores a second year, but then their scores a fourth year. 
Um, they're able to compare themselves to their, their classmates, so they are see, be able to see where they are compared to the mean of their classmates, and also compared to the mean for a reference panel of faculty um, that's used to sort of help derive the answer key. And so they kind of see where they're at along a trajectory of uh, developing their data interpretation skills. During their first course in medical school, students participate in a professionalism-based reflective exercise. <coughs> they're asked to think about uh, anxieties that they had prior to going to medical school and how they've been able to deal with those. They're provided formative feedback by the uh, course faculty uh, on their responses there. And then as part of their, four, their uh, third year medicine clerkship, they actually will keep a professionalism journal where they're asked to um, document different, both positive and negative examples of professionalism that they witness um, in the clinical arena. And then these, discuss, these uh, journal entries are then used as a basis for discussion in small groups with faculty members where they really can kind of uh, get to some of the, uh, get into some of the challenges related to professionalism in clinical medicine. So, you know, the implementation of our competency curriculum has really facilitated the addition of a number of additional activities and assessments related to each of these domains. Um, it's really given additional weight to these competency domains that really were not readily identifiable uh, prior to its implement implementation. Uh, the system has also improved our ability to identify students having difficulty in areas other than performance on examinations. In a review of the first 10 years of our competency-based curriculum, there were 1,323 cases referred to our Student Promotions Committee for a competency deficiency. Now, the vast majority of these were related to a deficiency in using science, as, as, which was defined as a, uh, which really usually reflected a poor performance on a medical knowledge exam. And so if you take those out, there were actually 191 students who were accounted for the remaining 233 cases that were referred uh, to the Student Promotions Committee for non-using science deficiencies. And each student was actually cited for an average of 1.7 deficiencies. Um, and actually the range was from one to 10 different deficiencies for one student. Um, and we did, have, we did have a number of students that were repeat offenders that we saw would come once and then you know, they would remediate that deficiency and would end up coming back again. Interestingly, only about 37 of the competency deficiencies occurred in students um, before they had began their clerkship years. So we definitely saw an increased number of deficiencies identified the further they went on in their education. This is just a, a graph showing the number of deficiencies cited in each of the competency domains. Um, as you can see, professionalism was, uh, was the most commonly cited deficiency, uh, similar to Ellen's uh, 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 experience at Lerner. Um, interesting, basic clinical skills was a close second. But if we actually look at that, there was a, a large uptick or influx of deficiencies in basic clinical skills when we implemented our new electronic system. And about 60 of those deficiencies were noncompliance with the uh, uh, with uh, submitting their information for their, uh, for, their, for their basic clinical skills as opposed to really true deficits in their clinical skills. Deficiencies in professionalism, self-awareness, and ethics were actually frequently cited together for the same student. So they might be cited for both professionalism and self-awareness or, or ethics and self-awareness or self-awareness and professionalism. So the Student Promotions Committee, along with the course and clerkship directors and competency directors involved, will devise a remediation plan based on the circumstances of the citation. They, these can range anywhere from include, sending a warning letter to the student um, about the problems, implementing an individualized learning plan, repeating portions of the curriculum, to being dismissed from school. And in general, most students are able to be able to remediate their competency deficiencies. But in 17 cases, students have been ultimately dismissed from medical school uh, solely for competency deficiencies. And the vast majority of those cases arose from issues with professionalism, self-awareness, and ethics. So the acceptance of our competency-based curriculum by both students and faculty um, has improved over time, but there are still aspects of it that are frequently seen as being add-ons uh, to, the, to the real curriculum. And you know, the addition of competency-related materials onto the already existing courses and clerkships, I think, contributed to that uh, perception. And the competency directors who are responsible for the curricular content and assessment related to their competency really have very little direct control over the curricular content. They really have to, you know, they're kind of left to find willing partners in, in the course and the course and clerkship directors to be willing to implement their new ideas and their improvements in course materials and assessments. 
Um, and I think that is, as well, that, that kind of has led to a number of things that are sort of non-course related activities. And I think that just adds to that perception that these competencies were added onto the curriculum as well. Um, another challenge that we have is that our students are actually not assigned an, a, a longitudinal advisor. They don't receive an advisor until late in their third year of medical school. And I really think having them uh, assigned to a, moving that assignment to the first year of medical school really could help do a couple of things. One is maybe we can identify some of these deficiencies a little bit earlier and work with these students before they get to their third year when they start to have a lot of uh, difficulties and these deficiencies tend to start impeding their academic process, their progress. So, like many medical schools in the country, we are looking at new directions. Um, we are in the middle of a curriculum reform. Um, and one of the things we've decided to do is go ahead and, and translate the content of our nine competency domains and organize it in the framework of the six ACGME categories. And really, I think this, one of the big things about this is to, is to sort of better align ourselves with the rest of, med the rest of the continuum of medical education. Um, I think there's some benefits for faculty there as well. Um, and so that's one, one big change. And the other big change is we're really going to be moving to more integrated courses and clerkships. And to me, one of the exciting things about that is that these are going to be new courses and clerkships that are going to be based upon these competency objectives um, that we have defined, as opposed to trying to interpose uh, the competency objectives and outcomes onto the existing curriculum. So having them inter, inter, interwoven with the courses as they're being developed. Um, so there's certainly a, a lot of challenges as we strive to implement a true competency-based education where you know, the student is promoted to the GME level, not based on finishing four or five years of medical school, but based on being able to you know, document that they have achieved a level of competence that is necessary to, to move on to the next level of GME. And I think really, the, to me, the, the, the biggest, one of the biggest challenges is having, having a robust enough assessment methodology and um, that really can predict the success at the next level. Um, and then also having the resources to be able to implement that type of a system. So thanks for your attention. And I think at this time, we're going to go ahead and open up the floor to questions. Are you? Oh, thanks. Uh, well, thank you, um, Alan and Butch, for sharing your experiences. I, I neglected to mention before that uh, Butch is not a general internist like most of us. Uh, he's an uh, emergency medicine physician, so we should be especially appreciative of him because he basically flew here to do this. <laughs> uh, he's flying back out tomorrow and had to go through three SIGM committees to get his registration <laughs> waived. Um, but, but um, you know, we, we, uh, we purposely left a lot of time uh, for questions and we're happy to entertain them and also feel free to share your own experiences. Uh, even though we're an intimate group, uh, could I ask you to come to the microphone just because uh, this, all these sessions are being uh, recorded? got a, a med peds person though um, we, we we do follow up uh, a year uh, a year with a, a year after graduation questionnaire to both the program director and the uh, and the medical student or the the resident first year resident asking how the program prepared them and and how the the, the student uh, uh, did uh, and they so they seem to be doing uh, actually very well on on the uh, on the most part. There are certainly some students that had weaknesses, 
that uh, really didn't correlate with the competency-based assessment system that we had. So it was, it was kind of an interesting um, uh, uh, analysis or outcome to, to, to find. We're working very hard to get our, our uh, f uh, we just had our fourth match. Um, about 80% of our students get the first uh, top two uh, programs, uh, the first or second uh, program that they want to want to get into. Um, I don't think we had anybody that was in the SOAP process uh, this year, so it, it's it's worked okay, but um, with absolutely no grades, no class rankings. Um, uh, nothing that allows us to rank order our students. The only thing that the, the students have are the USMLE tests, which I really don't think are, is an appropriate way of, of screening um, uh, resident applications, but that's exactly what's happening, and it's becoming more, <laughs> it, it's really affecting the second year of medical school. I mean, these students start getting uh, very, uh, anxious about the the scores to the detriment of their other learning, um, and just because that is the only score that's available. Well, I mean, I think we have a more traditional grading system. So our students are they you know they receive a grade for each of their courses they take, and they have they are they are put into quintiles for their MSPEs and all that stuff. So I don't know if we have the same challenges that you do with having a uh, you know a strictly Standard-based um, outcome measures. Uh, I think our. I think I'm trying to come up with the numbers from our PGY1 survey. Um, I want to say it's. I want to say it was somewhere around 90% of program directors said they would match our students again. So I certainly think that's a, a, a good number to see. Um, we still do miss some, so to speak. Um, there's been a couple that where I've seen comments from that survey where they just you know. How did you not know that this person was, had this or this or this issue? I can't believe you didn't find, you know. Um, so no system's perfect in ours with a large system. It is, it is still possible to fall through the cracks, unfortunately. But uh, I think our competency-based assessment methodology has improved our ability to pick up on, on people, uh, students who need help. Um, so in terms of the residency match, um, I can't say we didn't have any students go through the SOAP process. Uh, we had a, a, a little bit of a higher number this year than last year. I think that a lot of people felt across the country as the uh, competition increases for those match spots. Um, and I think it's going to be a, an ongoing challenge. And uh, I think that has trickled down to our second year students as well who are very anxious about uh, step one. So. I have a question for Alan, if that's okay. Please. <laughs> how, how many students does each of your physician advisors have, and how much release time are they provided for their uh, activities? Uh, they, the physician advisors have anywhere from five to 15 students, um, and they get anywhere from 10 to 25 percent uh, uh, time, uh, uh, release time to do that. Uh, we have a, a system at the clinic that's very similar to others where, you know, there's an expected percentage of time that you're supposed to give to this process, but the medical school gives uh, uh, less dollars to the department <laughs> than the, the real salary is. But um, the physician advisors uh, are a very tight group of people. There's mm -hmm. very little turnover in, in that group. It's something that obviously is very rewarding for, for them. But it, it is investment. I think it, yeah. if you're going to have competent, I was impressed with your comment about trying to move it up earlier, because I, I think you've you got to have, uh, if you're talking about competencies, you have to get people uh, uh, working with the students early to, to help guide them, I think. Do the advisors write essentially the dean's letter for your students, or how does that work? No, the uh, uh, associate dean for uh, student affairs and the, the executive dean uh, write the, all the, the letter. Actually, I think the students draft them, and then they, uh, they write them. But the physician advisors are not involved in, in any kind of uh, evaluation of the student. Uh, try to separate that role. Can you talk a little bit about the role of faculty development and whether um, 
all of your faculty are involved or as you've moved to the competencies, you've moved to a more core group of faculty or how you've sort of selected people for being involved in this since it is sort of different from some assessment systems in the past? Um, so ours, I would probably say it, it reached a large number of faculty because if the, so if a particular course or clerkship would, you know, adopted one of the competencies as a formal assessment, they would provide that development for their faculty. Um, we don't have that, we haven't really honed in on that core group of educators um, to really be able to focus a lot of faculty development on, on that smaller cohort. We really have done sort of kind of hit and miss things with people as they're participating in different aspects. Like, so when you're asked to serve as a peer and self-assessment faculty advisor, you're sent a, uh, a, a short kind of faculty development piece that kind of explains the process, kind of the types of things you should be talking about with the student and stuff like that. Um, but I, I'm going to say, I'm going to guess we had maybe 80 different faculty who did these peer and self-assessments. Uh, actually, it's probably maybe more than that. Um, so there's a large number of people who are doing them. Um, students generally self-select who they're going to go to. Um, in fact, I had somebody email me yesterday to uh, set up a time to, to do their uh, peer and self-assessment. So, um, so it, it really is kind of a hit and miss thing uh, for some of our staff. So that's, that's one of our challenges. We've, we have to sort of develop people on the fly as they're kind of coming out of, in and out of some of these activities. I think you put your finger on a very important component of uh, at least our, our curriculum and in instituting a new uh, curriculum and, and assessment system that uh, we have uh, 1.2 FTEs and, and uh, dedicated to faculty development and especially during the first two years uh, there's very intensive faculty development in terms of of getting them to teach in an interactive way rather than lecture. We, we don't like to use the word lecture. We'd rather have students read in advance and have them come in and apply uh, their knowledge. And getting faculty to, to, to feel comfortable doing that because uh, it gives them less control uh, does take some time. Uh, with a class of 32, though, it is very easy to uh, uh, be able to know whether students are applying their, 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 their knowledge. Uh, PBL is, is the same way. There's a lot of intense uh, uh, teaching there. And the uh, new faculty that join the, the Cleveland Clinic come through a new faculty orientation. Um, not required, but most of them do. And, and so we're able to actually show them what a, a student portfolio looks like. We have one, one uh, blinded one. And so they get an idea of why the, 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 this narrative data is uh, so important because Exactly, it's a lot easier to fill out a checklist than to write comments. Uh, we can keep asking questions of each other. Uh, but Alan, um, one of the things that really impressed me um, about Learner is the electronic portfolio. And it seems to be one of the secrets of your success to keep all of those hundreds of evaluations consolidated and compiled and delivered to the advisors, et cetera. W would you mind just saying something about the technical aspects of it, what it, what it can do, how you developed it? Uh, it was a homegrown, um, <laughs> it, it was a homegrown system. We were very fortunate at the very beginning to get a million dollar uh, grant from the Cleveland Foundation to, to, to start it up and to start up the, 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 the assessment process so we're able to uh, uh, devote a lot of, of time and effort into developing this, uh, this system. Uh, it's um, an internet-based uh, system that uh, allows uh, 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 faculty to put in, uh, get, get sent these forms and they're filled out electronically and it goes in uh, to the student's portfolio, the student reviews it. Um, there's uh, this, our IT staff has uh, got to be at least uh, three or four FTE that are involved in supporting this part as well as the clinical assessment part. Um, I don't see anybody from Cleveland in the room here, so that's, that's very good. I'll talk about the clinical assessment system, which, <laughs> <laughs> which uh, is used citywide because uh, we had to develop a common assessment system for both the university track and the college track. So what it starts with this formative uh, feedback system and then uh, for students in the university track, uh, the, the uh, clerkship director further goes through that and assigns a clinical grade to it. Uh, the CCLCM students that are going through just get that, uh, that feedback. 
Um, and that, it, it's, uh, it's met with much more resistance uh, outside the Cleveland Clinic than within the clinic. And it's more in the time of the faculty rather than. So could there be, could there be two students side by side, one who's going to get a grade and one who's Absolutely. not? Absolutely. Yeah. All the <laughs> that time. That must be interesting. Uh, it, they, yeah, they, they get used to it. I, I, uh, <laughs> Um, faculty don't really, uh, they, they know that somebody's going to get a grade, but it's really the clerkship director that has to come up with this assessment. Can I ask if, are, are there any program directors in here? Because I, I really would love to find out how we can improve this transition from an ungraded competency-based assessment system as in the undergraduate medical education and uh, have successful residency matches. Or you can just pretend you're not and, and just kind of. <laughs> Any other thoughts or questions? Yes, please. Hello. Um, I have a question about the professionalism aspect. Since you identify a lot of these students that have professionalism problems, which we do as well, um, and if more of them are occurring in third and fourth year, has it now made you think, what should I do differently in first and second year to prevent or promote professionalism um, behavior and attitudes? Um, so has that outcome changed how you think of it on the front end? Um, yes. You know, I think we've, we really have had a push um, that started after our competency-based curriculum started to sort of looking at the informal curriculum and trying to make improvements in that to help with uh, um, to help with those types of issues, uh, straight, you know, uh, targeting faculty to make, help them understand their, their role as a role model, help them improve their behaviors. Some of our health system partners have embarked on professionalism initiatives as well. Um, so I think it's kind of been a multi-pronged approach to that. Um, it, it's a challenging one because it, uh, you know, um, it, it's with a large, we, obviously with a large class, we have a large number of faculty, especially clinical faculty, um, that interact with our students and to try and, um, you know, and that's where I think a lot of the issues, that a lot of the role modeling happens. Um, and it may be out at a community hospital that, you know, we have our departments or, you know, we have very little control over some of their activities. So it's been a, it's been a real challenge. Um, and tr but trying to have, give students some of the tools to understand you know, how to deal with situations earlier on is something else we've been working on. So. I guess this is kind of a question for all of you. Um, I just wonder with these competency-based curriculums and this push to not have grades and to be more collaborative, which I think is great, but it, it kind of forces the USMLE, which is a, in my opinion at least, a terrible sorting mechanism, to be the sorting mechanism. How can we change that to make it so that we're getting residents in the fields that they want to be in, not in the field that is the most competitive that their USMLE score was good enough to get them into? It's something I struggle with. I don't know if there's an answer. Well, I, I have one suggestion, is to make the USMLE pass-fail. It makes much more sense to me. But then what would be a sort of, like how right. do we sort people? That's, that's how we that's, do it now, but what do you guys propose? Well, that's the problem. I mean, to me, the, the, why, I would ask the question, why do, why do residency programs use USMLE as one of their major ways to sort residencies? And the answer is because it's the, one of the few uniform measures they have of resident performance or of student performance. And so, you know, if you, if you gave me a blank checkbook and could change every medical school in the country, we would have a standardized method of assessment for all students that was competency-based and was applied, you know, uniformly. So you could say that a student from, the, you know, from the Lerner College or Stanford or Yale or IU or wherever they were, and they, you could look at them as apples to apples as opposed to trying to figure out the grading scale at this school versus the grading scale at that school versus a, a school with no grades. And so I think program directors fall back on USMLE because that's the one common thing they have for all these students. Yeah, I think it's, it's a difficult problem. I, I don't have a solution. My, my sense is that the reliance on the USMLE differs from specialty to specialty. And I think it's, 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 it's used much more 
uh, as a litmus test for the more competitive specialties, orthopedics, ENT, et cetera. And I, I think many of them even have a, a threshold score well above passing that they use to even invite uh, students for interviews. And uh, it's a terrible problem at Yale, um, as one of you mentioned, but our, our students su suffer almost paralyzing anxiety um, to the point that, it, that it, it prevents them from even optimally preparing for the test. Um, you know, we're even, we, our students are taking a course now, an optional course on how to reduce test anxiety. And we're sort of measuring test anxiety among our students. And, and, it, and it has been studied, I mean, not extensively, but it, it does not correlate with many measures of future clinical performance in later in medical school or residency uh, and beyond. But, um, and the only other thing I can say is, you know, you asked how, how can we sort the students, which, it, you know, even that word sorting is somewhat <laughs> incompatible with CBME, but, but I think that there, you know, there are narrative descriptions, I'm assuming, that you, that you supply that would enable you to describe students that are um, Performing at a very high level in some competencies, or is there is there is your sense that a program director can look at the narrative descriptions and and um, decide that student A is a better fit for my particular program than student B? Uh, I have to say I've, n I've never seen one of our dean's letters. Um, I've heard they're very different than other medical schools. Uh, that they they do go to great lengths not to to try to use any adjectives that would suggest any kind of, of grade. Um, but even without a grade, you know, the different students may have different distinguishing characteristics or that, you know, that may or may not be the type of student that you're looking for in this program, even though they're not ranked higher than this student. I, I, I don't know. I think our letters have a lot of quotes from the formative assessments. And so I think that not, not all students get the superlative uh, uh, evaluations that are just quoted within the, the, within the letter. So I, I would think there's a way of sorting it out, but you have to read it. I mean, it's not a, a quick number that you can yeah. do. Yeah, so I, John Voss from UVA. We're um, working on redesigning our whole curriculum around a competency-based framework that's pretty extensive. But I think what I'm hearing is that we have two extremes. We have, uh, you know, very granular data at the uh, USMLE level, but the competency assessments we have are really very general, and that there needs to be some middle way that integrates that together, and that, allow, that not only, you know, functions for UME, but functions for GME and then beyond GME, and allows us to start bringing in things like actual clinical performance. So how do things like ACO measures, if you're a physician, and MOC and things like that relate to this a much larger picture of what competency really means. And we're struggling with that. We've been working for <clears throat> about five or six years to build software methods to do that, but it, it's really an uphill struggle. But I think what I'm hearing is that the things that you're saying are a reflection of the fact that there are varying degrees of granularity in some of the places we've gone in competency-based uh, assessment, like what the ABAM is proposing, just may not be granular enough. Yet, it's very hard, like you guys at Cleveland Clinic are saying, to do those very detailed, um, but not necessarily a number-based assessment. But I think that's the challenge for us going forward. So that's just an observation, not a question. You know, it, it's, it strikes me, I guess, is, is if, if we're really talking about competency, um, a competency achievement, then maybe what we need to do is develop uh, other, uh, look at, at the much broader uh, characteristics of a, of a student and talk about what's exceptional about that student, not only in the, the, the competencies that we have, but the, the outside activities. Cause, uh, 
I, I think we underestimate the number of things that our students are, the excellent students are really getting involved with. I mean, they're involved in the community and they're writing and they're doing research and, uh, you know, certainly you can quantify and look at uh, uh, scientific papers and things like that. Um, inter I, I asked one of our uh, graduates, um, um, you know, what, uh, who's on the selection committee now for, um, radiolo uh, for, uh, yeah, for radiology, and asked him whether getting a master's degree, because that's an option within our program, whether getting an option, a, a, a master's degree would help uh, a student. He said, you know, it really wouldn't. What's, what's important is what you do with that master's. What's important is that you, that you publish with it, um, that you do something with it. Just getting a master's during medical school really, you know, this is an N of one, but getting a master's during medical school really doesn't give you a leg up, which I was very impressed with. Any final comments or questions? If not, I think we'll wrap it up and I'll thank my colleagues one more time. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.